like days. This stuff is crazy. People are sprinting. For now, all is at rest at the Vatican. But in just a few short hours from now, all of that's going to drastically change. Yes, you could have it. Because shortly from now, St. Peter's Square is going to be animated with thousands of individuals from all over the world. I'm talking about Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And for some of the people that will be attending this event, it will be somewhat of a capstone to a lifelong spiritual journey that they've been on, and that's no doubt. But for the majority, and I'm talking about the majority, this event is going to be nothing more than an opportunity for them to gather with thousands of people from every nation, from every kindred and every tongue and every people and focus their attention right there. And they'll all be focusing their attention right there in hopes that they might catch even but a short glimpse of the world's very first rock star pontiff. I'm talking about Padre Mario Bargoglio, the man whom the world better knows as Pope Francis, the very first Jesuit Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. But did you know that there was a time not too long ago that a pope wouldn't even step foot out into the precincts of St. Peter's Square, let alone step out onto the balcony of the Vatican Basilica? And if you find that little soundbite interesting, then wait until you find out the reason why. On February the 10th, 1798, Berthier, which was the general of the infamous Napoleon Bonaparte, he led the armies of France in an invasion against the city of Rome, where he captured Pope Pius VI and led him into exile in France, where he died in the year 1799. Now, on this occasion, 
the French powers declared that Rome was now a republic under the French Directory. And as you can imagine, that was a huge blow to the pride of the popes because prior to that, the papal states, which made up the majority of the major states in Italy, where the papacies claimed that the Pope didn't just possess ecclesiastical authority, but he also possessed temporal power as well. In other words, the papacy was saying that the Pope is the chief authority over both church and state. But when the French declared Rome to be a republic, although the papacy still retained its ecclesiastical power, a major deadly wound was inflicted on its ability to act as the head of civil affairs. And what's so interesting about this whole historical event is that 2,000 years even before it occurred, it was prophesied to take place in the Bible, in particular in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, where the word of God tells us, And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now, if I was to tell the majority of you out there that the papacy is a very controversial institution, 
the majority of you out there wouldn't even believe what I'm talking about. And this is simply because within today's secular society, people aren't really familiar with the sordid past of the papacy. And then in recent days, they've done an extremely good job in putting a lot of time and effort into sculpting a new public image for themselves. But nonetheless, at heart, the papacy is an agency that detests the separation of church and state. For instance, in the year 1905, the French made a law that made the separation of church and state a reality within society. And in protest against that, Pope Pius X released an encyclical entitled The Hemnitor Nos, which means our passion or we feel very strongly about this. And in that encyclical, he stated that not only is the idea of separation of church and state a false thesis, but he called it a pestilential error. So Pope Pius X and his papacy felt very strongly against there not being a separation of church and state. And they were willing to protest against anybody trying to make it a reality. And he's not the only pope that tried to protest against this separation of church and state. Matter of fact, in the year 1870, the Italian troops once again went into the papal states and they stripped the pope of his authority over central Italy. And this infuriated the Pope so much so that their temporal power was once again rendered null and void that for 59 years there wasn't a Pope that would leave the Vatican. I'm talking about from Pope Pius IX all the way through Pope Pius XI. They made themselves prisoners of the Vatican. They wouldn't even go out onto the balcony of the Vatican Basilica because the Vatican Basilica faces St. Peter's Square and that was occupied by Italian troops they refused to acknowledge the authority of the Italians over the papacy. But something was going to happen very shortly from then that would radically change the position of the papacy. And not only change the position of the papacy, but the event that was going to transpire was going to radically change the face of the entire world. On February 11, 1929, General Mussolini and Carl Gaspari came together inside of this building. It's called the Lateran Palace, and they signed a very important document which came to be known as the Lateran Treaty. Now, what the Lateran Treaty effectively did for the papacy was restore to it the sovereign power that it was drooling for. It made the Vatican effectively a state within the state of Italy without any outside interference. And so from that point forward, the papacy has been growing in its political influence. Five months after the Lateran Treaty was signed, the Pope once again stepped foot outside of the Vatican onto the balcony of the Vatican Basilica. And although this was a very simple gesture, it was a very profound political statement that he was making. Because in this one gesture, the Pope was letting the world know he refuses to be looked upon as simply the pastor to the kings of the earth, but rather he must be acknowledged by the nations of this earth as a king of his own right. And you have to wonder why all of the prime ministers and presidents and even kings of the earth would come from north, south, east and west to come and pay homage, reverential homage at that, to a king whose government only occupies maybe a little bit more than a hundred acres. 
it's because the followers of the Roman Catholic Church make up more than one-seventh of our world's population. We're talking about over 1.2 billion Catholics that follow the Pope. Now that makes him more than a formidable political adversary or friend to have. That's why the leader of the free world would come and pay homage to a king that has a government that's not even bigger than a cattle ranch in Texas. Now that you're a little bit more familiar with the sordid history of the papacy, it should be easier for you to understand why the whole world was shocked on February 11th of 2013 when Pope Benedict XVI just decided out of nowhere to resign his position as the Pope. He was the very first Pope to do so in over 600 years, a dramatic move that made history, but it also opened the floodgates for a very important historic move to take place at the Vatican. Because as a result of his resignation, they set up the very first Jesuit Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about Padre Mario Bargoglio, Pope Francis. Now I want you to think, out of all of the dates that Pope Benedict XVI could have chosen to surprise the world with his resignation, why do you think that he chose February the 11th, a date that just seems to harmonize perfectly with the majority of the historic events that are associated with the papacy's conquest to maintain their authority over both church and state? Now it could all be coincidence, or it could all be by design. Do you think maybe that the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI was really the papacy beginning a new phase in their attempt to grab within their hands temporal and ecclesiastical power and unite them the same way they did from 538 AD all the way through 1798 AD when they ruled over the then known world? Could it be possible? Well, ladies and gentlemen, guessing isn't going to give you the answer. You see, the Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 16 and verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. And I assure you, 
as we look at the Holy Scriptures that were inspired by that very same spirit of truth, you will not only better understand what's going on now in the world and the papacy's role in global events, but you're going to see what's getting ready to happen in the very near future. So today I'm going inside of the Vatican and Pope Francis is scheduled to come out at the St. Peter Square, so Anything can happen today. I might get picked up by the Vatican police, might not make it back home. But this is my job. I've got to make sure that everybody knows the truth. And trust me, when I get done here, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows the truth. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, the Word of God gives us a very significant prophecy dealing with the papacy. We are told there, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns, and upon its heads the names of blasphemy. Now, when you're looking in the book of Revelation, you have to understand that you're looking at many symbols. The Word of God tells us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show to his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to give unto his servant John. And that word signified means that the revelation that was committed unto John to give to us was placed into symbolic language. But no worry, the Bible actually decodes itself. And so when you're looking at a beast in Bible prophecy, it's not a literal beast. It stands as a symbol of something. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 2, we are told by Daniel the prophet, which is one of the most significant prophetic books in the Bible in connection with the book of Revelation. The word of God tells us there that Daniel saw the four winds of the heaven striving upon the great sea. And he saw four great beasts coming up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Then the word of God goes on to tell us in Daniel 7 and verse 17, these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Then to make it even clearer, in Daniel 7 and verse 23, we are told, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy is symbolic of a kingdom. In more contemporary terms, we would say a political power or a state. Now, did you notice how the four prophetic beasts of Daniel chapter 7, which we've come to find out are really kingdoms or political powers, as well as that first prophetic beast of Revelation chapter 13, which is as well a kingdom and a political power, all of them are seen coming up out of the water, coming up out of the sea. It's evident that this water must be symbolic of something. And the Bible gives us a clear understanding of what water is a symbol of in Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. We are told there, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sittest, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Therefore, waters in the Bible can be symbolic of a very highly populated area occupied by many nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. Letting us know that this beast or political power, this kingdom in Revelation chapter 13, came into prominence in a highly populated place on planet Earth, and it ended up ruling over many nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. And what's so interesting about that prophetic beast, which is a kingdom or a political power in Revelation chapter 13, is that the Word of God tells us under that symbol of a beast that it had upon its heads the name of blasphemy. The reason why that's so significant is because a kingdom or a political power is a secular entity. But the word blasphemy has very specific religious connotations associated with it. So what we're looking at in Revelation chapter 13 is a political power that unites church and state. We would call that a religio-political authority. Now, the Bible actually gives us a definition of what blasphemy is in the book of John chapter 10 and verse 33. When Jesus was being contested by the Pharisees and they began to pick up stones to stone him, Jesus asked him, For what good work are you going to stone me? They said to him, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. 
and because thou being a man makest thyself God. So to blaspheme is for a man to make himself God. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible gives us another definition of blasphemy. We are told there, Who is this man that thus speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So according to the Bible, if a man professes that he has the ability or the authority to forgive another man's sins, he's committing the act of blasphemy. Now, in just a few minutes, you've actually learned a great deal about this first beast of Revelation chapter 13 because you found out that a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a political power or a kingdom. You found that out in Daniel chapter 7. And in particular, this beast of Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, it must be a religio-political governing power because it blasphemes. And the word blasphemy has very specific religious connotations associated with it. And the very fact that it blasphemes means that this religio-political system, this religio-political power that unites church and state, it must exalt a man to the position of God and profess that it has the power or the authority to forgive sins. Now tell me, do you know of any system that's in existence in our world that fits that identity? man, Pope Francis, receives the adoration of God. And as you can see, the whole world is wandering after the beast. This man is being looked upon as God on earth. This is clearly blasphemy. There's no doubt about it that the papacy fulfills the prophetic role of the beast of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. This is horrible. You may be wondering why I'm here, what you're looking at. Right now I'm inside of a confessional. This is a booth with inside of the Roman Catholic Church in which its adherents are told that they must come and confess their sins to the local presiding priest, at which point the priest will not only hear the sins of the petitioner, but then prescribe to them to say a certain number of Hail Marys and probably do some other type of penance so that God will forgive their sins, or rather that they will forgive them of their sins. This is a perfect example of blasphemy because the Bible tells us that no man can forgive sin but God. But the Roman Catholic Church has set up a system in which people have to seek a man so that they might feel as though they've been absolved of their guilt, which they have incurred by transgressing the law of God. Now in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2, the Bible gives us even more critical information in not only identifying this beast, 
but understanding its character and the way that it operates. We're told in Revelation 13 and verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. So this one singular beast is actually an amalgamation of several different beasts. A leopard, a bear, and a lion. Now what's so significant about this is that those three beasts that make up this one singular composite beast in Revelation chapter 13, they're actually spoken of in the book of Daniel chapter 7. You see, in Daniel chapter 7, there's a lion that has two wings of an eagle. It's a prophetic symbol of the kingdom of Babylon. Then there's a bear that's risen up on one side and it has three ribs in its mouth. It's a prophetic symbol of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And then there's a leopard, a leopard that has four heads and four wings of a fowl. It's a prophetic symbol of the kingdom of Greece. The lion, which has two wings of an eagle, it's a symbol of the kingdom of Babylon. The bear, which has three ribs in its mouth and risen up on one side, it's Medo-Persia. And the four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl, it symbolizes the kingdom of Greece. And the four-headed leopard, which has four wings of a fowl, it symbolizes the kingdom of Greece. All of them collectively come together to make this one singular amalgamation of a beast in Revelation chapter 13. And note carefully, that when John the Revelator saw this vision of this beast in Revelation chapter 13, he said, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Yes, it has the feet of a bear, and it as well had the mouth of a lion, but primarily its appearance looked like a leopard. This is letting us know that the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, in a marked fashion, would personify the characteristics of Greece. So you may be wondering, how exactly are we going to figure out what principles or practices or even ideologies that the Greeks were notorious for have today been adopted by the papacy and are practiced very prevalently within the ranks of Catholicism? It's an easy question to answer. All we have to do is go to the very same source from which we've drawn the rest of our answers, the Bible, the living Word of God. You see, in the book of Acts, chapter 17 and verse 20, when Paul was in Athens, which by the way, at that time was a part of the territory of Greece, he said that all the Athenians and strangers that were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So in other words, the Greeks were a people that loved to engage in human philosophy. They loved to exalt human reasoning. And then in Acts chapter 17 and verse 21, when Paul stood up to address this multitude of Athenians, he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Superstition was something that was ingrained within the culture of the Greeks. They were a people that were caught up in paganism. So the only question that remains is this, is the Roman Catholic Church a system of worship that exalts the philosophy, the human reasoning of men above the living Word of God, the Holy Bible? And have they adopted original pagan practices within their religious belief system and have retitled it Christianity for the masses? If you're not sure, you're getting ready to find out.
Right now, we're in the Basilica of San Clemente. And if you're not sure that Roman Catholicism is nothing more than paganism revived and dressed up in Christian garments, then you need to visit this place because what you're going to find out here at the Basilica of San Clemente is that this so-called Christian edifice was built on top of a structure where the pagans would come and worship their patron god Mithra, the sun god. And not only that, but the Christians ended up fusing in their worship system paganism. And what you have is nothing more than an amalgamation between Christianity and paganism. So the Bible is clear and very precise in identifying Roman Catholicism as a cult mystery worship revived in a system of worship that professes to exalt Jesus Christ. It is astounding what you'll find right here in the Basilica of San Clemente. On this stone artifact, located within the ruins of the Temple of Mithra, you'll notice this carving of a decorated evergreen tree. It's known as the Sarve or the Rocket Juniper. It was erected to pay homage to the birth of Mithra during the time of the winter solstice in the month of December. Children would decorate this tree with their wishes that they would wrap up in colorful pieces of silk cloth and then hang them on this tree as offerings to the sun god Mithra. In 353 AD, Pope Julius I authorized that during the winter solstice, a time which was previously reserved by the pagans for the celebration of the birth of the sun god Mithra, should now on December 25th be a time to celebrate the birth of Christ, hence the emergence of the Mass of Christ or Christ Mass. Though partially marred, you can clearly see on this wall of the temple ruins of the sun god Mithra two solar wheels. These solar wheels have eight spokes. They're symbolic of the eight solstices, one of which being the solstice of winter, which was known as Yule. This is where we get the phrase Yuletide greetings from, which people use during the Christmas season. Interesting enough, in the Basilica of San Clemente, located just above these pagan ruins, you can find the very same solar wheel that was used in the worship of the sun god Mithra. But what's even more astounding is the puzzling fact that the largest solar wheel that is known to be in existence is found right in the midst of St. Peter's Square, which is the seat of the papacy, the sovereign governing authority over the Roman Catholic Church.
You know, there are a lot of things that you can argue with in this life. But one thing that you can't argue with are facts. And as you have seen over and over and over again, the fact is that the Roman Catholic Church is a system that exalts the philosophies, the reasoning of men above the living Word of God, the Holy Bible. And the Roman Catholic Church led out by the papacy is a system that has adopted pagan practices and have baptized them and renamed them Christianity and given them to the masses. That's what we're looking at when we look at the papacy. In a real way, the Roman Catholic Church amplifies those leopard-like principles that we saw in Greece. But I want you to think about something. Why would God even use a leopard to symbolize that system? Remember, in Revelations 13 and verse 2, the Bible says, The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Yes, it has the feet of a bear, and it as well has the mouth of a lion. But why would God say that that system predominantly resembles a leopard? Well, we looked at the aspect of how it personifies the principles of Greece. But you know something? God is a wise God. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that all the words of God are pure words. And when God says something, it has great depth of meaning. There are two lesson books that God has given to us from whence we should draw information that we can deem as truth. The first lesson book is the Bible. The second lesson book is nature. Because nature testifies of God. Even in Romans chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the heathen doesn't even have an excuse for not acknowledging that there is a God. For we are told in Romans 1 and verse 20, even the invisible things of him can be clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Through nature, man can come to comprehend many things of God. What's my point? My point is this. There's a lot of truth in nature. Why? because it was authored by the one whom is truth. And if God would deem it important to use a leopard to identify the papacy, there must be something about the leopard that is very close in comparison with the activities of the papacy. In simple, I'm saying that the papacy and a leopard must have a lot in common. And the Bible tells us something about the character of a leopard in the book of Jeremiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. So we're told there, Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goeth out thence 
shall be torn in pieces. Notice the Bible tells us that the leopard is a creature that watches before it seizes upon its prey. Then in the book of Hosea chapter 13 and verse 7, the Bible says, Therefore I shall be unto them like a lion, as a leopard by the way shall I observe them. The Bible makes it clear. The leopard is a creature that watches and observes. And it watches and observes before it does what? Before it moves out to violently seize upon its prey. And a leopard never makes a dramatic, drastic move until it believes that it's sure of its prey. Do you think it may be possible that the papacy is just like that? That it's an agency that carefully calculates its moves before it executes. There's something else you need to consider about the leopard. It's not a vegan. <laughs> a leopard is a carnivorous creature. Now I know most of you out there are saying, I already knew that, so what's the big epiphany? I want you to think. Remember earlier, we found out that in Bible prophecy, a political power or a kingdom is symbolized as a beast. A beast is an animal, and that's what leopards eat, other animals. Do you think the leopard-like beast, the papacy, may be calculating the moves of the political powers of our world so that it may know when the time is right to strike that it might once again set itself up as the chief leading authority on planet Earth over both church and state. And as you consider that thought, I want you to consider this as well. A leopard, when it hunts, it tends to prey upon the weak and the young. The weak and the young. So do you think there may be a weak and young beast, or rather, a weak and young political power that's now in existence, that the papacy is looking upon as ripe for the kill? Ladies and gentlemen, what you're getting ready to find out may astound you, but it's absolute truth that you need to know. In the book of Revelation chapter 13, 
The Bible speaks of another prophetic beast, a political power that begins to rise into prominence on planet Earth just around the same time frame when that first beast of Revelation chapter 13, which we've already identified as the papacy, receives its prophetic deadly wound, which mortally appears its ability to exercise temporal power on planet Earth. The Bible tells us in Revelation 13 and verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon. Now we've already found out that a beast in Bible prophecy is symbolic of a political power or a kingdom. But notice how this second beast in Revelation chapter 13 is seen coming up out of the earth. Now that's directly in contrast from the originating point of the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, which we see coming up out of the sea or the waters. There has to be something significant about this. Now it may not be readily apparent to you, but there's definitely something significant about one of these beasts being seen coming up out of the sea and the other one coming up out of the earth. If you remember, the Bible is very clear on explaining the symbolism of what water represents prophetically in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, the Bible clearly states that in prophecy, waters are a symbol of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, a highly populated area on planet Earth. And historically speaking, the papacy did rise into prominence in a very highly populated place on planet Earth. People call it the old world. But in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, we see something that's the direct opposite. We see the beast coming up out of the earth, meaning that this is a political power that would rise into prominence, not in a highly populated place on planet Earth, not in the old world, but it has to be a nation that's rising into prominence in a sparsely populated place, perhaps the new world. And when it would rise into prominence, it would have a very specific agenda. You know, there's something particularly intriguing about this new beast of Revelation chapter 13 that just makes it stand out in striking contrast from its predecessor. In Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, the papacy is symbolized as a beast that looks like unto a leopard, it has the feet of a bear, as well as the mouth of a lion. These are all predatory animals. However, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, this new beast is spoken of as coming up out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb. Now, a lamb is not a creature of prey. We're talking about a very docile and peaceful animal here. So this is letting us know that this new political power, this new nation, when it would rise into prominence, it would promote peace on planet earth, or at least peace within the borders of its nation. Furthermore, in the Bible, the lamb has very specific symbolism associated with it because in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, the Bible says, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In the Bible, the Lamb primarily stands as a symbol of Christ, Jesus Christ. So, this is further insight into the nature of this new political power. Because it has two horns like a lamb, the Bible is letting us know that this would be a peaceful nation that would profess itself to be a Christian nation from its inception.
Now, when the Bible uses these two horns like a lamb to identify the second beast of Revelation chapter 13, it's doing more than using these horns as a symbol of the character of this nation being peaceful and Christian, because horns in the Bible have very specific symbolism associated with them. In the book of Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible says there, his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and therein was the hiding of his power. Horns in the Bible can stand as a symbol of power. And because these two horns are like a lamb, these are lamb-like powers or Christ-like powers because Christ is the great lamb of God according to John chapter 1 and verse 29. And in the Bible, we are given a clear understanding of some principles or powers that are conveyed upon humanity by Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. The word of God states there, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Know carefully two principles, powers associated with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, are liberty and freedom. So let's take all this information and put it together and see what we have. We have a beast coming up out of the earth in Revelation 13 and verse 11, or rather a kingdom, a political power, a nation, rising into prominence in a sparsely populated place on planet earth. Let's just say it's the new world. And as this nation rises into prominence, it has two horns like a lamb, or rather this nation promotes peace, it professes to be Christian, and it upholds the principles of liberty and freedom and just throw in justice for all. And what nation do you have? You know exactly what nation we're talking about. It's none other than the United States of America. So now that we've been able to identify clearly from the Bible that the United States of America is this second beast of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, which is identified as having two horns like a lamb, there's something very interestingly frightening that we have to also take notice of because we're told that this Christian nation that will promote peace, liberty, and freedom and justice for all under the symbolism of these two horns like a lamb, it would ultimately speak like a dragon. And the only way that a nation can speak is through its legislative bodies and its judicial officials. For instance, this is the United States of America's Supreme Court. It's the highest lawmaking body in the land. When the justices of the Supreme Court rule on an issue, it's as if they're speaking for the nation. And the Bible says that the U.S. will one day speak like a dragon. And there's only one dragon that the Bible speaks of, and he's found in the book of Revelation 12 and verse 9, where the word of God clearly states, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is telling us that the United States of America, this once great Christian nation that promoted liberty and freedom, peace, justice for all, will one day begin to repudiate the principles of its constitution to make way for legislation that will promote the agenda of the dragon. The devil himself. Now, if you're a thinking person, I'm just going to assume right now your interest has been piqued as you've come to the reality that the United States of America, this nation, is going to prophetically speak like a dragon, setting in place legislation that will fulfill the agenda of the devil himself. But that's an issue that I'm going to have to delve into in greater detail at a later date. But I've presented this information right now to bring you to a point that I would really like you to focus in on. For this nation to reach to the point that it would speak like a dragon, set in place legislation that will fulfill the agenda of the devil, it has to first repudiate the principles of its constitution or first go back on those two horns like a lamb, those powers that lay at the foundation of the strength of this nation, which are republicanism and Protestantism, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's a republic and Protestantism, meaning we can worship what we want to worship, when we want to worship and how we want to worship. 
but by definition, to be a Protestant really means one that protests against the Catholic Church. And historically, the United States of America was a nation that protested against the Catholic Church. That's the reason why the pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock, so that they could enjoy religious freedom. But what will happen if the government of the United States of America begins to take the power out of the hands of the people and begins to put it in the Oval Office? But what will happen if the politicians of this country look to the papacy to act as a mediator for their international relationships? What will happen if the presidents of the United States of America begin to have birthday parties at the White House for the Pope? Then, ladies and gentlemen, this country is no longer operating like a republic and that horn of power is being weakened. And this country will no longer stand in a position as protesting against the Catholic Church and that horn of power is being weakened. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is, if these things begin to transpire in the United States of America, then indeed what is taking place is the weakening of the horns of republicanism and Protestantism. These two lamb-like horns that lay at the foundation of the strength of the success of the United States of America. Thereby, this nation, instead of being a mighty nation, will be rendered into a young nation that is now weak, the very type of beast that a leopard likes to make its prey. And what I'm suggesting, or what I'm trying to help you comprehend, is that as the United States of America has been making radical changes in its policy, we've been paving the way for the leopard-like beast, the papacy, to rapidly once again rise to the ascent of the chief leading authority in planet Earth, in the realms of both church and state, a position which it's been salivating for since 1798 when it received its prophetic deadly wound. And as you begin to look out into our world with me, as we analyze the current events, it is undeniable that right now we are living during a time period in which we are seeing these prophecies fulfilled right before our very eyes. And this means that all of us need to make some very serious decisions. Let us be clear, we are here tonight because the president continues to conduct an illegal program. The president started this program without congressional permission. We are not collecting the information of spies. We are not collecting the information of terrorists. We are collecting all American citizens' records all of the time. Are we going to so blithely give up our freedom and realize that they were dishonest about the program until we caught them. They kept saying over and over again, we're not doing this, we're not collecting your records, and they were. Vice President Joe Biden will head to Rome for the installation of Pope Francis. Biden is America's first Catholic vice president and the highest ranking Catholic official in the country. This is the centerpiece of the president's whole, whole, whole presidency. He's choosing what will be enforced and what will not be enforced. And I want you to just let your mind drift back to when people left Europe to come to America. They got in rickety old wooden boats with not very good nav systems, but they came here for a reason. They set their course true north. They were coming to get away from a monarchy. They were coming to get away from an, an imperialist. They were getting away from tyrants. Why did they come here? And what did they craft? It is so carefully laid out in our Constitution. So why are we having this debate about this is silliness? This is who we are. This is who we are, not as Republicans and Democrats, but who we are as Americans. Why would we turn our back on our Constitution? I worry very much about the United States moving rapidly into an Orwellian type of society. And, you know, it's not just that the NSA is collecting every phone call, virtually every phone call made in America, has access to your websites that you visit, the emails that you send. It's the private sector knowing what books you're buying, what food you're reading, your medical records, your banking records. This is really scary stuff. I understand the executive office has great power, but I also understand that the Constitution harnesses that. It does not allow it to run roughshod over the people. Tens of thousands of people lined a parade route, and thousands more filled the South Lawn of the White House. 
as Pope Benedict XVI celebrated his 81st birthday and was officially welcomed to America. Happy birthday, Holy Father. This is critical that we look at this. The executive cannot make it as exceptions and just enforce the laws he or she wants. That's not who we are as a people. Two groundbreaking world leaders met this morning for the first time. President Obama greeted Pope Francis in Vatican City, saying, I'm a great admirer. We left monarchs. We left tyrants to come here. This is a government by the people, for the people, and of the people. If we ever forget that's what our job is, as members of the House of Representatives, then what are we doing here? It turns out that that historic breakthrough between the United States and Cuba this month owes a lot to Pope Francis, the leader of the world's 1.2 billion Catholics, personally lobbied for the deal, and the Vatican hosted actually the final meeting between the two sides that led to the breakthrough. Do we have to worry about martial law? Is, is our federal government coming in and going to practice imposing martial law on Texas? The military is labeling Texas, Utah, and Southern California as hostile. This is actually taking areas of our home country, the United States, and saying, Texas is hostile, Utah is hostile, Southern California is hostile, and we got to take it back from the hostiles. I find that incredibly offensive. And he thinks it's no coincidence that the Jade Helm 15 map looks an awful lot like the 2012 political map. So-called hostile states are colored red. This is statute that's being trampled upon by an executive has an overreach that we've never be seen before. As we continue our coverage of what can only be called a historic day at the Supreme Court, legalizing same-sex marriage across the land. Five unelected black robe judges have taken over the government, have rewritten an institution that's 4,000 years old, an institution that relies on, on popular consensus and ancient tradition, and there is no authority whatsoever in the Constitution uh, for them to do so. With each decision of ours, that takes from the people a question properly left to them, we move one step closer to being reminded of our own impotence. Can we not please return to those days of why those folks came here? What were they seeking? Freedom and liberty. What have we allowed these people to do? Turn their backs on that and turn away from it and turn away from a constitution that over a million people have given their lives to make sure that we could have this today. On a happier note, a bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. His Holiness will be the first pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. So our investigation has taken us from the old world to the new world. And what you just witnessed, that was just a minuscule representation of the malignant immorality and shameless disregard for liberty and freedom in the United States of America that is destroying its once valued Protestant ideals and undermining its status as a republic. And as a result of all this, the leopard light beast, the papacy, has been able to gain traction so that it can rapidly move forward to seize upon its prey. And when you hear me say over and over again that the papacy is going to make the United States of America its prey, 
I'm not somehow trying to suggest that the USA is one day going to be consumed by the papacy. What I'm trying to help you understand is that currently, the papacy is preying on securing the civil power of the United States of America. That the U.S.'s status as the world's leading civil superpower can be enlisted on the side of the papacy to accomplish the papacy's ecclesiastical designs. Because historically, that's the way that the papacy always operates. For instance, in the year 508 A.D., through presenting itself as the leading moral authority of mankind, the papacy was able to influence France to enlist their civil power on their behalf to uproot the Aryan nations that were antagonistic against the rapid progress of Roman Catholicism in the world at that time. And then in the year 533 AD, once again through insidious political maneuvering, and presenting itself as the moral compass for society, the papacy was able to influence Emperor Justinian to declare the Pope to be the head of all Christian churches and the corrector of all heretics, thereby successfully enlisting the civil power of the armies of Rome to crush out any individual or any group that would dare to protest against the papal bulls or encyclicals of the popes. And as the Bible makes it clear in Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23, that it's impossible for a leopard to change its spots, just as impossible as it is for an Ethiopian to change the color of his skin, we can know of a certainty that the papacy, the leopard-like beast, it will never change because Rome never changes. I know it may appear as though she's changed her ways, but all we're looking at is a well-tailored disguise to cover up her true intentions Ever since 2013, when priest Mario Bargoglio became Pope Francis, the Roman Catholic Church has underwent extensive renovations. And Pope Francis, he's been able to capture not only moral influence, but political influence on a worldwide scale that has not been known by any other pope in the last millennium. And he's done so, so gracefully, and yet at such a breathtaking pace that the current progress of the Roman Catholic Church can only be rightly represented as the tactical attack of a calculating leopard. And in September of 2015, when Pope Francis makes history by becoming the very first Pope ever to address the US Congress, and then makes his way over to the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, where he will address the world meeting of families, you can be certain that he will use these two platforms to challenge the policymakers of the United States of America to rethink their fundamental understanding of what constitutes liberty and freedom and how these principles should be implemented within society. And even more importantly than that, he will use at least one of these platforms to suggest to our world that there is a need not only to abide by biblical truth, but papal policy, papal policy like the first day of the week, Sunday, being a sacred day, which has no root within the Bible, but was established as a day of rest by the papacy in the year 321 AD by Constantine the Great. He will suggest that Sunday needs to be a day of rest, not only for Christians, but for all mankind for the purpose of the reunification of the family circle and the salvaging of the destruction of society. And when these seeds of deception are sown, they will not be done so without making an impact. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth all the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The Bible is speaking of a time not far distant from now in which the United States of America like the papacy of old, will use its governing authority in the realms of both church and state and will give over to the papacy its civil power, its civil influence, providing for the papacy its long sought for remedy to heal its deadly wound. And when this happens, the Bible warns in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast, the papacy, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, people are getting ready to wander after a system which the Bible clearly declares blasphemes against God. It is the enemy of God. It is no friend of truth. 
and it is no friend of you. The word of God warns us in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is why God admonishes all humanity. In the book of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. In these last days in which we are now living, all humanity will be engaged in one final conflict. And this conflict will concern the controversy over worship. Who will stand on the side of the worship of the true and living God? Or who will stand on the side of the worship of the beast? The choice is yours. And ladies and gentlemen, time is running out. So now, now is the time that you make a wise decision. But please choose life. Because why would you die for your sins when God gave his son Jesus Christ to die? so that you might have eternal life. And that, my friend, is a fact. And whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth. <laughs>